Welcome to this time of worship. Our theme for this service is God's grace. Grace is a lovely name, isn't it? Do you know anyone called Grace? My husband's grandma was called Grace. Most of the time she was a very gracious lady. <laughs> I'm going to read first of all from the Psalms and the Psalm that we're reading today is number 41. This reading is really a prayer for God's mercy and his grace. For he is a God who always remains at our side, no matter what happens to us. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He doesn't give them over to the desires of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. I said, have mercy on me, Lord, heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? When one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely, when his, while his heart gathers slander. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying a vile disease has afflicted me. He will never give up from the place where he lies. Even my closest friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. But may you have mercy on me, Lord. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, Amen and Amen. And our second reading is from the book of Timothy, the first book of Timothy, beginning to read at chapter 1, verse 12. And in this reading we are hearing Paul's testimony to the grace of God which he received. So at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considers me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. So my message for you today, what do we think grace is? It's quite difficult to define grace, but it is lovely to think about God's generosity to us. Perhaps you might like to think about it in this way, God's riches at Christ's expense. A new way to some perhaps, but an easy way to think of it. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. The good news of the gospel is that we cannot become a Christian simply by doing good works. Christ gives us the gift of grace. 
God forgives and frees us from the mistakes of the past. None is higher than the other, as an old gospel hymn put it, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So why bother to do good if God accepts us already? We say that salvation is by grace and not good works. The motivation changes from getting a reward to doing things out of love and compassion as an act of gratitude. For God has done so much for us, so why not do for others in the same spirit of generosity? When we do good works out of thanksgiving, for the sheer love of doing it for someone, we're free. We know we're accepted by God. We don't have any reason to feel taken for granted, resentful or self-righteous. Better to do one act of love and gratitude to God than to do three good deeds, grimly trying to obtain God's approval. For God's rewards are great. He is a generous and gracious God. And our reading from Timothy is written by Paul. And he used to be actually quite a bad person they, when he was called Saul. And that happened until his conversion on the road to Damascus, when the grace of God was poured out for him. Have you ever meditated on the grace of God? Who is the source of grace? How does it operate? Are there different types of grace? How do I get more grace? Can I lose grace? What does grace accomplish? The word grace is used everywhere, secular and sacred. It can be a name, as we've talked about. It can be a place Elvis Presley lived in Graceland. Ernest Hemingway wrote the phrase, courage is grace under pressure. And many of you will be familiar with that hymn by John Newton, Amazing Grace. I still get goosebumps and a little teary in the eye when I hear that song and am reminded of Newton's transformation from a vile, drunk slave trader into a preacher and a pastor. John Newton knew firsthand about God's grace. Can you say with Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But if we dig a little deeper and look below the surface, there is a lot of confusion on this topic of grace. Paul's past and the vile reputation he had was changed through the glorious reconciliation that he experienced when he became a believer. He found a new source of strength when he found Jesus and he set his whole life apart for God's service. Paul's purpose in life changed when he was called to be an example and to exalt God for the rest of his life. Grace was poured out on Paul in abundance, and not just grace, but faith and love found in Jesus Christ. For all of us who have received Christ as Lord and Saviour, the same grace, faith and love has been poured out on us. Notice that Paul says that this grace, along with faith and love, are found in Christ. There are those people we come into contact with who live their lives based on good intentions. Some of them are involved in religious or community activity and doing good things. But the only giver of this special grace, faith and love, is Christ and that special relationship that we have with him. Paul's only, Paul's only purpose in life was to be an example to those who would believe in Christ and receive eternal life. And verse 16, it says, However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says, I was shown mercy so that I could be an example to others. 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, A person's life and their actions are always more forcible than their speech. When people take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. It is his life and doctrine. If they are different, the mass of onlookers will accept his practice, not his preaching. Those who knew Paul well and the kind of man he had been were probably amazed at the transformation that took place in his life when he became a believer. What an amazing testimony Paul had. If God could transform a man like Paul, then there was hope for the vilest of sinners. And we see clearly one of the purposes for God in his mercy, reaching down and saving Paul. And that was for him to be an example to others to turn to Christ. Our own testimonies or stories can be a powerful example to those we come into contact with so that they will, too, they will, they will also believe in Christ and return, receive eternal life. So I want my message to be practical for you today. Here are some of the things we can take from this passage and apply to our own lives. Are you seeking strength from the Lord? You will, you will find it by reading God's word, meeting with other people, praying and confessing sin in your life. As you are rightly related to the Lord, he will equip you and give you the strength necessary to do his work. Is the Lord your strength to minister to others in the body of Christ? Is he your strength to minister to your neighbour, your friend or the people you meet? Are you faithful in the ministries that the Lord has appointed you to do? All of us have been given special opportunities of service for the Lord. Are we doing those acts of service to glorify Christ or just to glorify ourselves? Are you taking advantage of opportunities to use your own lives as an example to others, to show them how they can become a believer and receive eternal life? Are you exalting God? Is praise your practice or do you prefer to grumble and complain? We have been challenged with many things from the Word of God today. Let's do as James instructs us in his letter. Faith, he says, by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, it is dead. And faith without deeds is dead. So as James says, we need not simply to be hearers of the word, but doers as well. We grow in Christ-likeness as we open our lives to God's presence and power at work in us and the world. Growing in grace and discipleship cannot be done within our own strength. The one who invites us on the journey towards the fullness of grace accompanies us and supplies our needs. The God who liberates us and gives us a new future enables us to live toward that new creation by providing means by which we can grow in grace. At the heart of Wesleyan Methodist theology, there's a profound understanding and experience of grace. John and Charles Wesley shared that understanding deeply rooted in their Christian teachings and traditions. They provide they provided that distinct emphasis which came to character, characterise what Methodist teaching and preaching was about. Grace, as understood in, in the United Methodists and in the Wesleyan tradition, of course remains as re relevant today in the 21st century as it was in the 18th. The Methodists still try to gather together in small groups, which then were called class meetings, and they watch over one another in love, trying to avoid evil and practicing good things. Doing good and practicing is a means of grace. And other means of grace are just to worship God publicly, to minister to his word, either read it or explain it. 
Also the supper, the communion as we call it, of the Lord is another means of grace. And prayer, prayer whether we pray together as a family or privately. Searching the scriptures and doing our Bible studies. All of these John Wesley identified as part of Methodism, but also a method for following Jesus. As well, of course, as acts of mercy and compassion. These were all means of growing in grace. Gifts and skills that God gives each of us are the means by which we grow in friendship with Christ. And through them we express our devotion and open our lives to the presence and power of God to transform us and the world. So they become the means by which we are nourished in grace and grow in love for God and our neighbour. So how do we do our singing? Is it with a desire to exalt God or exalt self? How do we do our teaching, our cleaning, our witnessing, our serving? Is our aim to make Christ known and exalt his name in the eyes of those we minister to, or is it to glorify self? Does our service say, look at me, or does it say, look at him? In that reading from Timothy, what is Paul's source of strength? Well, in verse 12, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus for our, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. And Paul says, our Lord gives me strength. Paul doesn't take the credit for his strength. He's giving Jesus Christ the credit for his strength. And notice also in verse 12 that God appointed Paul to service. The ministry Paul was accompanied to was service to God. And this is a key factor in any ministry if it is to be a success. God is the one who does the appointing and the work he appoints us to do is one of service. Paul says he has been warned by the Holy Spirit. He is warmed by the Holy Spirit and he expects to receive some hardships and he has gone through terrible imprisonment and hardship. So what kind of person could handle being warned he was going to be despised and jailed and yet he continues on in the task at hand? What kind of a superhuman would it, would it take to be able to face such trials? Well, the good news is that it doesn't take a superhuman. It takes a spirit-filled human. Paul is quick to give the credit to Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the strength he had, the strength to face many trials. So there, what is Paul's source of strength? In verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled or strengthened me. And Paul says, our Lord gives me strength. Paul doesn't take the credit for his strength. He's giving Jesus Christ the credit for his strength, which comes through the grace of God. Is there a ministry that God has called you to that you have refused to be a part of? There are many things that God has appointed us to as believers. If we are parents, he has appointed us to nurture our children and raise them in the Christian faith. If we are, part of, if we are um, married, he has commanded us to love our husbands and wives as Christ loved the church. If we are a part of a family, we have opportunities to serve that the Lord has appointed us to. And we need to make sure we are not neglecting our duties as husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, even grandmothers and grandfathers. In our larger family, in the body of Christ, we need to be sure we are faithfully doing our part as well. What has God given you to do with his grace? Are you faithfully serving him in those areas? Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your teaching today. We ask, Lord, that you teach us every day to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
Let us not be intimidated by opposition or criticism. Keep us firm in the faith you have set before us through Christ and with the Holy Spirit who guides us in your ways. We pray now for the things we see in the news happening in our world. We pray for the people who are suffering and for those who are trying to help. Bless all employers with a spirit of fairness and grace. We remember all who have to queue for work and all who depend on social security. We pray for those who are without work and on low incomes, for those who cannot get work through prejudice. May all who prosper be generous and willing to share with the needy. We give thanks for our own work and homes. We pray for all who supply us with the things we need. We remember homes where families go hungry and those who are in great debt. We pray now for those people we know in our own community and our own families who are struggling or need your help and strength. We give thanks for those people we know who have been faithful labourers in your kingdom and we pray especially for them now and remember them quietly in our own hearts. Lord, you opened your loving arms to us on the cross and you welcome us into your kingdom. May your saving power be known to us and lead us into ways of peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit in everlasting love. Amen. And now we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so, may the deep peace of our gracious God be in your hearts and minds, in your actions and in your life. Trust in him always and place your hope in him. May God the Father give you grace, glory and peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.